This is Keys to the Shop, episode 119, a barista training masterclass with Willem Davies. Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFurio. I'm your host for the show. And today we get to sit down and learn from the 2009 World Barista Champion, Gwillem Davies, and learn about his approach to training baristas. So this is definitely going to be a very useful episode for those of you wanting to get the most out of the hours spent in the lab and on the bar, getting new baristas up to speed and experienced baristas improving their skills. Uh, Gwillem brings a lot of really great insights and uh, perspectives to this conversation around barista training. His long career has allowed him to see and participate in many different ways and formats of training, and he has developed a lot of wisdom along the way that he passes on to us in this conversation. So really excited to share this with you. Now, today's episode is brought to you by Prima Coffee. Prima is a specialty coffee equipment supplier. Uh, They're based out of Louisville, Kentucky, and since they began their company, they have been providing the best coffee brewing equipment to both the general public and professionals in a spectacular way. Uh, Their focus is on curating the best equipment for every need, from grinders to espresso machines, undercounter refrigeration, um, anything you could need for your home or commercial setup they have at Prima Coffee. They put a really big emphasis on having the expertise to help their customers get the right gear to fit every situation. So if you're in the market for some equipment that your coffee bar desperately needs, you're opening a cafe or you're expanding one or upgrading your existing cafe, definitely check out prima-coffee.com. Again, that's prima-coffee.com and see how they can set you up with the exact right equipment for you and your needs. Uh, Definitely let them know that Keys to the Shop sent you. And my thanks to Prima for their support of Keys to the Shop. This episode is also brought to you by Pacific Foods. They are the folks behind the Barista Series line of non-dairy performance beverages, which are designed specifically for professional baristas in the standards for excellence that they demand. So uh, whether you're using their almond, soy, coconut, rice, or their newest oat milk, its ability to take the heat from steaming, produce an unmatched silky texture, and keep the flavor balance focused on coffee makes it a perfect choice for your cafe's menu. Pacific is a huge supporter of specialty coffee and the barista community. Uh, They've demonstrated their passion for that by uh, listening to and serving the needs of real specialty professionals. So definitely check out pacificfoods.com and learn more about the Barista Series line of non-dairy performance beverages and how they can elevate the non-dairy offerings in your cafe. So thank you very much, Pacific, for your support of Keys to the Shop. Okay, so today we are going to be talking about barista training. And, you know, training baristas is or should be an ongoing process. You know, there is the onboarding process. There's the training that happens uh, in cafes that could last anywhere for a few days to a few weeks or months in some cases. Um, The first hours spent with a new barista will often determine the trajectory of their time in your shop and how they view coffee in the barista role. So putting your best foot forward in the training process, in the beginning especially, is super important. Uh, And today we are going to be learning from somebody who has dedicated his career to training baristas in a simple and effective manner um, with a lot of just learned wisdom from a world of experience. We're going to be talking with 2009 World Barista Champion and Barista Trainer, Willem Davies. Um, I'm a huge fan of his uh, approach to education and his approach to training. So it was really thrilling to be able to get him on the show. Um, Willem started his career back in 1997 bussing tables in New Zealand uh, cafes He returned to the UK in time to manage second wave cafes as they started to appear in London. Um, After that, he went to work on the beginnings of what became the third wave. Now, fast forward uh, nine years and uh, various roles in the industry, and Gwillem became the 2009 World Barista Champion. Now, winning the championship gave him the opportunity to do a lot of traveling 
as well as uh, the opportunity to open and jointly own the cafe Proofrock. So throughout his career, he has met, worked alongside of, and trained baristas in 40 countries, and he has settled down in Prague, where he has shared a barista training center with his wife Petra for the last five years. Gwillem is an authorized SCA trainer and also teaches his own coursework in his school. So in this conversation, we briefly talk about his beginnings in the coffee industry, and in particular, how he came to this point where he has focused so much of his career on uh, training baristas. And uh, we talk about everything from how to prepare yourself for training Um, what you should be focusing on as far as uh, course content when you're uh, building a training program. Now, we talk also about uh, getting your ego in check and uh, intuition versus scientific approach. Um, We talk about making mistakes as a trainer and developing yourself uh, as a trainer by challenging your assumptions as you go and always learning. And we discover uh, a lot about Gwillem's attitude toward training and what makes him such a successful trainer in the coffee industry and one of our industry's most sought out barista trainers. So there's a lot here, a lot of wisdom to be shared by Gwillem. So let's get right to this interview with 2009 world barista champion and barista trainer, Gwillem Davies. Gwillem Davies, welcome to Keys to the Shop. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Hello, Chris. Um, I feel as though I'm giving something back today because I really enjoy your podcast and uh, I almost feel guilty that I'm listening to it for free. So it's my absolute pleasure to be on. Thank you for saying so. That's really awesome. Um, I wanted to talk to you for a while about training. Um, I've always appreciated the approach that you have to training baristas and you know, demystifying is a word we use a lot in um, training circles. And, you know, it's ironically more complicated than demystifying it. <laughs> We're going to go into that. But um, I remember meeting you way back in 2009 backstage, just a quick hello, I think, back in Atlanta at your uh, WBC routine. A lot's changed for you over the years. And, I, you know, you've got your training center there in the Czech Republic. And, uh, you're you're living the dream, and, and I wonder how how did this really? If you could just encapsulate sort of uh, how this all started for you, the road into coffee, and what led you into being a full time trainer. The problem with being in coffee for so long is that uh, that's a very simple question, but it can go on for ages. So I'll be incredibly brief. <laughs> uh, it basically, um, I got into coffee initially because the people, uh, the people were so interesting and weird, and I'd never come across such a bunch of people like it. There's a lot of talk at the moment in coffee about inclusivity and how some people feel as though they're on the edge of an industry. Well, right at the start, I was attracted because it was full of those who were not included anywhere else. It was an incredible, creative, exciting bunch of people, uh, and I really enjoyed being part of them and then of course once you're in coffee you you just get hooked and then despite the poverty and the broken relationships and everything else that you suffer along the uh, career of uh, coffee um, especially when we didn't actually know that there was going to be such a industry it's the last time I saw you then in Atlanta I mean it's blown incredibly Mm. as an industry and changed then we had no idea and In fact, my routine was a bit provocative in some ways. It was trying to stir up conversation. I was using it as a platform. And that's not needed now. It's a much more mature industry. Yeah, that's a great point. A lot of people used the stage at um, various levels of competition to make statements that about drink preparation or philosophies on coffee preparation that you know, now we, we have regular discussions on. We don't need to sneak it into a routine necessarily. Uh, that, that's definitely changed a lot over the course of the years. Um, when, when you look back, what is it that uh, past being attracted to the culture and the people, 
you're making coffee for a living and you decided that training people, being a full-time trainer was something that you wanted to do um, for the foreseeable future. What was the moment where you found yourself thinking, this is, this is it for me, or at least as far as I know? No, there was nothing like that. It was a case of necessity. There was no one else to train uh, people. And I'd been in the industry so long that I had uh, experience that people actually came looking for me and asking me questions. So it was sort of thrown on me. And that was a big problem because back then we were doing things on intuition. And <laughs> my entire um, first 10 years of coffee, because there was very little information out there, uh, was all learnt uh, from hours in a shop and then basically became intuition. I'm saying there was no information out there. There was. We just didn't know it was there, which is deeply upsetting. We were, it was a new industry. We were excited. We wanted to do something interesting. But we forgot about people like uh, old uh, Earl Lockhart and his brew control chart. And if I'd have seen that information from the 50s and 60s, um, I think I would have advanced them much more quickly than I had done. That's interesting. I think I was talking to somebody the other day about the fact that a lot of that information that was floating around in the 50s was so progressive compared to what we were trying to do in the 90s and early 2000s, <laughs> as if we were reinventing the wheel. Yeah, and it's still very difficult to get hold of that information now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to dig for it. Um, yeah. but you went from a intuitive, uh, approach based on, based on, you know, necessity of what was around you at the time, which probably, um, helped you get a, f there is a feel aspect for coffee still in spite of the, the measurements and, and things that we use now. Yeah, there is, but it's very difficult to teach. Mm -hmm. Um, there, there's sometimes you would stop the shot and then you go, why did you stop the shot? And you go, well. You just knew. And then when I thought about it, it's like, maybe it's like, I can hear the pump. And mm. I know my pump. And I know what's happening. And uh, it was just, I knew from experience that I had to stop it that little bit early. And I, I couldn't explain it or teach it. It wasn't really until, until 2010. Uh, so I won the Bristol Championship 2009. 2010, we started weighing coffee. It started looking at, to try and understand espresso and the extraction. Uh, that's, and oddly enough, that's when I actually started getting worse. I think I made the worst coffee the year after I'd won the WBC than uh, like five years previously. Just because you were experiment, you were trying different machines, um, different coffees, you were weighing, you, you were analyzing what you were doing, and I actually became worse, and it took me sort of a year to pick it back up again. But then, of course, I understood coffee in a completely different way to before. It was much more fact-based that I could actually pass on to people rather than intuition I can't pass on. Not yeah. I can. I imagine the um, explosion of what I think is an explosion of good coffee in, in the world. And what I see here in the U S at least there's most major cities have multiple double digits of really great espresso bars and coffee bars. And the sharing of information with common language seems to be one of those factors. Yeah. The, at the start, there wasn't uh, many people really, uh, they, they couldn't, I, have been that many of us compared to to now and some of the language was formed then and we actually formed some facts back then as well that uh, over the years we've slowly um, been getting rid of for other facts <laughs> air quotes or <But>, are... <laughs> yeah I think I think that though helped me um, both as a person and a trainer because um, I challenge myself, am I right? And if I'm not right, I'm okay with that. 
because back in uh, the late 90s and 2000s, we, we were wrong so many times. And it was only at things like Barista competitions when we got together and a few forums where we were learning just how wrong or how right we were. Mm-hmm. Usually how wrong. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I, I bring that into my trainings now, both as when I talk to people and I'm not 100% sure about the fact, I'll say, it's like, look, I'm 70% sure mm-hmm. about this. Or, yeah, this is like 90% sure. Uh, rather than a fact. Also, I'm trying to teach them that it's okay for us to make mistakes as long as we keep challenging what we think is right and not just blindly identifying with some stupid little thing. I imagine a lot of people will want to come to a training session and leave with facts and leave with ironclad rules for success. Um, and maybe it, it, is it slightly frustrating for people to receive a 70% (laughs) uh, right answer? Yeah, it's more, it's, you're right. It's more easy now than it used to be like 2010, 2011. It was very difficult to give absolutes then because things were changing all the time. Uh, it's much easier to give absolutes now i mean the some people will come in and we can do a couple little experiments we can uh, make a few coffees uh at different brew ratios and i can show people very quickly the influence of water on extraction water is the biggest influence on extraction from our recipe Mm -hmm. and you can show people that Really clearly, yeah, it took us, um, well, it took me two years of writing down our dialing in procedures with uh, TDS and extraction and temperature and so many things. It took two years of writing it down to then look at it and go, oh, <laughs> put more water in and our espresso would be slightly more extracted and we'll stop getting it. It was like... Um, there's a guy called Jeremy Chandler who I opened proofwork with and he used to call them the 17% years. Oh. And it was when, uh, it was when uh, at proofwork we were, everything was extracted to under 18%. And we just couldn't, we were trying to push it forwards and trying to push the extraction. And the only thing we had to do was just, you know, drop a little bit more water in our espresso. <laughs> so, I mean, it's very basic. People who are listening now who've been making coffee in the last three years, will not understand that because to them it's obvious. But to us back then in 2011, it wasn't obvious. Mm -hmm. Well, and you were under the same spell, uh, so to speak, as as people who enter the coffee industry now are, which is wedding themselves to rules that uh, once they find themselves being frustrated by applying those rules, can't see that the rule is the problem. It must be something else. Yeah. When you, the, when you are new to something, you always have to follow the rules, don't you? Whether they're right or wrong, you follow those rules until you understand them. And then once you understand enough, then it's, uh, it's time to start challenging those rules. Agreed. Uh, so what is your philosophy now after all of this experience, oh. philosophy on barista training and education that you bring to your school? Do you, um, Chris, I, you're, you're, <laughs> you're making me think. You're using words like philosophy. Um, I came from hospital. Well, I went to a teaching college, uh, so I was around teachers a lot, but I, I went on a different track. Um, and into hospitality. So I teach, I teach basically with my hospitality background. So I, I get a customer and they come in and they, they have wants and needs and I fulfill that. And I try and make sure that they go away happier than when they arrived. So the basic hospitality thing. Um, there's things they want from the training, so I've got to find out what they want. But there's also things they need from the training that may not be the thing that excites them, but that's the thing that they need to go away and be uh, a better barista. 
But alongside that, I, I need to inspire them. I found once I was doing some work in Moscow uh, at a chain of coffee places called Coffee Mania. And I did uh, once, once uh, a month, I did some training sessions for the baristas. But then I'd go around the shops and I'd say hello to the baristas and taste their coffee and chat with them, all very unofficial. And I found that was one of the things that drove the, the baristas more than this monthly training session. Yeah. That inspiration was more important to them than the knowledge. So now I, I try to inspire, but give the knowledge. And if I can, some values, because specialty coffee comes with values. They're values that attracted me to the industry. And they're one of the things that have kept me in the industry. There's many things wrong in specialty coffee, uh, but it's one of the industries that uh, has people in it that I can, I think, can make changes to the world, positive changes. And I want to keep that sort of value system strong. I like to try and bring in values as well as knowledge and some inspiration. Excellent. So it's not just the coffee training, it's the training of the, the person. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Even if they don't know it sometimes. Um, sometimes it's not very often I go to actual cafes and uh, teach groups. And there's always some that are not really that interested. And they're not going to be there very long, And which is why I don't go and do it. I, I like people coming to me. Um, mm. And if I can't teach those people... I can teach them the basics of how to be a barista, but if I can teach them some other life skills as well thrown in there, um, then when they leave being a barista in six months' time, at least they've got something else. They've taken something away from it. Transferable skills. I think that's probably the the poshy term, or the intellectual <laughs> term. So uh, looking out from your perspective as a trainer, looking into the world of other trainers and other ways of teaching and educating people on coffee and, and making it in cafes, what is it that frustrates you the most uh, that you see out there, the people doing it wrong, the approaches that frustrate you the, uh, the most? Um, I should really say that uh, oh, it's fine, whatever they want to do, they want to do, and that's okay. There's different ways of doing it, but you're right. There's always, I'm a human and I get frustrated. And one of the big frustrations for me is that there's trainers out there that think that uh, coffee came from the English world, the English speaking world, and all the ideas and all the theories and all the knowledge is kept inside the English speaking world and that the rest of the world can learn from us. We are like missionaries. We go to places from our English speaking coffee background and we teach them all about whatever it is. And it's absolute nonsense. Um, so that, that arrogance annoys me sometimes. People, people getting things wrong. That annoys me. It shouldn't annoy me. Simple things. <laughs> when, you, when you see, uh, I'm ranting now. When you see, when you're on Facebook and somebody goes, oh, I've done here and I've done some training. And then people are holding the temper incorrectly. And you're thinking, oh my gosh, in six months time, that person's going to have problems with their wrist. Mm -hmm. that, that is like, man. Um, people who aren't checking their facts and their ideas, they're just regurgitating something kind of an opportunistic go at being a trainer yes it's like uh, the idea that i understand or uh yeah you can teach anybody anything if you you don't need to know the subject you can just teach mm -hmm. and uh, it's not oh I, i'll tell you a little secret fact about me um once um i taught anthropology at oxford university um Oh. And I wasn't meant, yeah, I wasn't an official lecturer. I just, <laughs> I just managed to get in and teach a class on uh, anthropology. <laughs> and I was, I, I, I pulled it off really well. But you know what? I really wasn't an anthropology teacher. And uh, I shouldn't be in Oxford University teaching anthropology. And it's the same people with, with coffee. It's like, if you are going to teach coffee, learn about coffee, keep learning about coffee. No, uh, don't stop learning about coffee at 
the time. You have to, it's changing all the time. You have to be, you know, every few months, you have to be constantly learning yourself. Not necessarily, oh, that's another trainer I hate. It's the trainer that uh, goes into a class and tells everybody ex everything they know because they're so special. Mm. And even the newest things they've learned, it's like not relevant. It's relevant to you as a teacher because you need to keep an eye on the industry, but you should be teaching them what they need to know, not the things that you heard last week or uh, just read in a book. It's like you, you must take that, try it, structure it properly and put it into your class. You can't just vomit new information to people who aren't quite ready for it yet. Maybe they haven't had the foundation built properly. Uh, awesome. Yeah, guilty. I've uh, it, done that in in my past, uh, you know, almost twenty so years hard. now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, and and you learn from it too because there's an insecurity that comes with being in an authoritative position as somewhat of a, a peer. We're really, you know, we're, we're trainers, we're managers, we're we're consultants, and etc. But in a sense, we're all peers, and there's this sense of. Um, you know, at least from me, for me, there's a sense of guilt or insecurity that comes with with training that I feel the need, sometimes the urge to make up for by impressing people with something like, oh, I'm still relevant, or uh, I knew this new thing, I found this new thing that is, is fact to me now, but may be proved wrong later, so I might be eating my words. <laughs> there is a place for it, but it's right at the end of the training with the right people. Mm -hmm. In the right situation, but uh, yeah, they, they, it's when it's it's easy for us because we've been in coffee for so long and we've picked up so much information that's hidden away in our long term memory, and uh, other people haven't got all that like uh, library in their long term memory. So we start saying things, and their short term memory just gets boom full. <laughs> <laughs> straight away so we, we have to like uh, slip it in gently yeah feed them gently no, that's a great point um i wonder if you can speak to this uh conundrum i think that is in in training we have a, a tendency to feel as though if we have to go back on something that we've told somebody especially if they've paid for the class um, then we are betraying their trust in some respect. Um, speak, how do we get over that uh, hurdle? I've uh, I've definitely got used to that a long time <laughs> uh, in the past. Um, teaching somebody distribution methods or tamping, and then uh, three years later, somebody going, "But you taught me like this." It's like, yes, but I was. <laughs> In the past, but it, and the thing is, if you look at your information, and at the time it was best practice, and it was established practice, then that's okay, because things move on and things change. Mm -hmm. So it's it's going to happen. But it is the the worst thing about training is, for me, is is the passing on of some basic knowledge. I actually. I actually get a little bit bored sometimes if I'm doing um, some more basic barista or, or, to be honest, it's like some more intermediate. Somebody doesn't know how to tamp. It's like, okay. So we have to spend half an hour teaching somebody how to tamp. I have no interest in teaching somebody how to tamp for half an hour every single day. It gets really boring. It's a very simple task that uh, has a very simple purpose. It's not sort of complicated. And either the old people come in with uh, strange ideas that we used to have in the past about tamping, and uh, the new people have to you know, manipulate their arm into the, the right place and make sure they don't end up hurting themselves. Or, um, <laughs> I, as a trainer, I am actually I, I'm, I'm getting a bit fed up of um, I, I I have to word it right knowledge transfer or just basic knowledge giving basic knowledge that they don't need from me. They can uh, come with that knowledge. It's something they can read. It's something that an online course can mm. teach them. Uh, my, um, per, I, I'm, not like, I'm not like a book that just talks to them, like an audio book. 
that's not that's not what I want training to be. I want training to be somewhere where they can ask questions because you can't ask questions to an audio book uh, and get direct answers. I want people to practice with me and uh, practice those skills. Uh, and I want them to go through some exercises with them, with me. Uh, and maybe I can start mixing the knowledge they have together, which complicates things a little bit more. But the actual simple basic knowledge in training needs to go away from trainers and needs to just go online. And if it's online, it can be changed. If it's a book, it's, it's stuck and you're stuck there and to reprint, but to put it online, fantastic. It's a brave new world. Yeah. Currently, I, I just send out um, information sheets uh, because I can change the information sheets uh, before people come. But um, really, I think online first and then trainer afterwards. And that's something you could do as an owner, too. You could codify the basics, the intermediate skills, or the beginner skills into something the way the way that you do as well to send out to your new baristas to yeah. have digested partially by the time they get to you. It's a much better use of time. I mean, my time is limited. There's only one of me. And uh, if normally people come for two or three days, then they can maybe just come for one day, mm. which is a much better use for everybody's time. Sure. I'd like to know, in terms of preparing yourself to train people, um, a lot of a lot of mistakes that trainers make has to do with um, bar side manner, we'll call it, or the way that they aren't prepared necessarily to teach, but are finding themselves in a position of teaching all of a sudden uh, because they're good at coffee. They get made the trainer, and now they've got to train all of these people. What do you suggest people do to prepare themselves to train others? So prepare themselves, not to prepare the room or anything, but to like um, prepare yeah, their, themselves. Yeah, their heart and mind to be in that position of of that um, knowledge giver, the, the the one to groom the the staff to prepare coffee. Well, like that's a big responsibility, and it's you know if you're not prepared yourself, you might get more frustrated than you should get, or um, yeah. just give up halfway through the the class. I don't know. To personally prepare, I mean, every person's different, and so each person will uh, need to prepare in different ways. For me, so I'm talking personally, uh, I had to keep my ego in check. So it's the idea that I didn't just walk up, see it as a presentation by me, and vomit information and facts uh, and ideas. I had to actually lose the ego, uh, go back to basics, see what was important uh, for them. And to do that, I, um, I used that idea of first principles. So what are we trying to do? We are trying to serve a tasty cup of coffee. Okay, how do we do that? So we break it down. That, that's how I got rid of the ego and just focused on the, the aim, was by breaking it down into first principles. Other thing I found difficult, which seems to contradict the first one, but it, it doesn't, uh, it didn't, is um, speaking in groups. It's okay on some days. On other days, you start like, uh, like you're not, almost becoming anxious. You're, going, you're all nervous. And then there's a group and there's somebody in the group for some reason is freaking you out. And so um, <laughs> practice. And, and so maybe they're just staring at you or even it's maybe it's they're not they don't seem to be taking interest or anything um so practice talking to groups where you are the focus where there's four or five people who are just staring at you even the one-to-one -one, sometimes the one-to-ones are more scary than the group ones you're with this one person all day and uh, you know, it's difficult. So yeah, speaking to other people and managing the groups, and then there can be skills that uh, people have learned maybe um, in sport or other groups that they've been in or just 
practicing it maybe um, in the cafe <laughs> talking to customers. Sure. Maybe there's uh, a, a group in that is from out of town and you uh, suggest a yeah. bar to, the, to them and you, you speak up and maybe not let your coworker be the one to always interact with the guest and take the opportunity. Absolutely. There's sometimes there's those people that sat, they're out of town and you can take two minutes to walk over to their table and uh, pour the coffee at their table because uh, we do table service in Czech. And da -da, pour the <laughs> pour it at the table uh, and say, hey, you're out of town. What are you doing? And, and just, yeah, little bits of practice. I, I found talking to people really difficult in groups. Mm -hmm. Talking behind a bar with an apron on and a hat, uh, I had a barrier. But in, in a group where I'm meant to be the expert, yeah, I found that pretty difficult. Otherwise, um, we've mentioned this before, but remember how it's like to learn. Go and do something you can't do. I did uh, sushi. <laughs> I learned how to uh, make and roll sushi. Absolutely terrible. There was like <laughs> four steps. And I couldn't remember the four steps. Very simple to the man who was teaching me how to roll sushi, but not simple to me. Mm -hmm. And the same goes for preparing espresso. Four or five simple steps, but they can't quite remember. They're always forgetting something. And uh, they just need practice. It really helps you empathize. Yes. So it's about empathy and remembering uh, what it's like to learn something that is completely alien to you. Um, other than that is, um, prepare it, know what you're going to say, when you're going to say it, is your timing going to be okay? How, what are you going to achieve by lunch? What comes after lunch? What time will you finish? Leave time for questions, uh, at the end. I imagine that really helps you avoid vomiting all that information in the first hour. And now you've got two, three hours left of nothing, but... <laughs> Q and A. That's, yes, and going. I've got nothing to do now. <laughs> I'm done. I usually mix it with um, practice. I don't try and change the subjects too much, so I try and follow a theme that slowly builds. Um, but we'll change from we'll we'll do some knowledge, and then we do a little bit of recall. Uh, then we'll do some practice, and then. A little bit of knowledge and then sort of recall and practice do do that sort of thing um and a couple of things i tried uh, one well um one came from matt perger and he once said to give an exam at the start so for a while i was giving people as soon as people came in i gave them the exam right at the start it's like okay what do you know so i found out what they knew and then i tailored the training um to what they knew Oh, interesting. Uh, rather than wasting time doing things that they didn't know. And you can check things during the the practice and during the questions when you're sort of asking general questions. It saved a lot of time if I had um, a, a lot to cover. Fascinating. That's excellent. Um, what Now, you are prepared as a trainer and you step into the room. What are some practical things that the trainer needs to do to train those people to have a barista exit that training session with you or that week of onboarding if in, in a cafe or whatever um what are some things that you found as techniques for training that are invaluable to good results preparing <laughs> so preparing yourself uh so you have your handouts um make sure your handouts have pictures on them because people remember pictures much easier than they do uh, words. Or it, maybe they don't. Maybe it's because I teach people whose first language is not English. And it's much easier for me because my whole presentations are sort of based around these little uh, pictures with as few words as possible. I try to keep the words right down. There's space on the paper for people to write. So they have a clipboard and they have... Uh, pencil or pen there um, and some of them doodle and when they're doodling I need to and 
I, I need to figure this out. When they're doodling, they're actually like concentrating. I, I need to create some pictures that people can actually doodle, like draw on, um, that is actually relevant to the class. But I haven't figured it out yet. Mm. So I'm, maybe I'm a uh, doodler myself. That, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and if they're doodling something relevant to what you're saying, it's helping them make the brain links to to remember what you're saying. So it's uh, I, I need to do that. The so there's preparing yourself. Uh, you've got handouts. I usually I put all the handouts down there for the morning, and then different ones in the afternoon. So when they sit down, they start flicking through, and I have no problem with that. I quite like it when they know what's going to happen because I'm explaining to them what's going to happen during the day and they have the little pieces of paper and then they're just clicking through and they can sort of see what's coming up next and it uh, um, seems to work. Uh, so as well as preparing yourself, oh, and stupid things like I shouldn't even be saying, like make sure you sleep well. <laughs> It really, really makes a big difference if you go in and you've slept well and uh, you've eaten properly and you've looked after yourself. Mm -hmm. If you go in tired and uh, you haven't been eating well and you're not thinking properly and focusing, it's just you're just not going to have a good time. Uh, then, as well as preparing yourself, prepare the space for the students because it's hospitality. They're coming to you, or you come to them. You have to, you're in charge of their experience. So they need to know where the toilet is. They need to know they can go to the toilet whenever they like. There's some cultures, I've learned this from experience, will sit there and not go to the toilet because I didn't tell them that they could go to the toilet. Oh my. And it was uh, rude for them to ask. So now I have to tell them that they can go whenever you like. Then it's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Make sure there's pens and paper and they know the structure of the day and when you're breaking for lunch and if you can have another break so they, they know what's happening. Have you found in terms of the content of what you're teaching that there is a, um, a certain percentage of beginning information versus advanced information that works the best, like 80%? reiteration uh, or teaching of and then reiterating beginners and intermediate skills and then uh, uh, capping it off with a few advanced or how do you structure the delivery of information during the course of a, a session yeah some of it is just checking what they know it's much easier when you've had the group before and you or you know them so maybe it's a cafe that's come and I, I know what the culture is in their cafe and what they know uh, or it's somebody who'd done the basic, then they're doing the intermediate with me. Um, so I know what they've done. Um, I much prefer having somebody that's been here and done a basic one with us. Mm -hmm. And then I'm taking them on to the next step. So I know, cause otherwise, I then have to check what they know and see if they understand um, things. That's where the test came in. Um, now I have more people that are returning uh than when i'm for when i first started of course people were returning because they're coming for the first time so uh i needed to get to know them so the little test right at the start helped now i i know them i know a lot more of the people who are coming for trainings on which makes things easier um but i will go through basic technique and judge the I use the morning to judge the experience of the group, how much they know. And then in the afternoon, I know how far to push it. Every single training is different, and it really depends on the, the group. I have a basic amount that I, need, I want to teach them. And then if the group's going quickly, I will start putting extra things into it. So it's a flexible thing. Okay, and you know, like those things ahead of time. If this, then I have prepared all of these other things that will, be, all of this other material I'll put in place because uh, they've let me know they're ready for it. And this applies to, you know, when you hire two baristas and you have your trainer um, or you as a trainer bring them in and they need to be bar ready in a week. 
this exploratory phase sounds really useful. And then getting them up to speed uh, with all of the details might be something that they get taught a little bit later. So the beginning information has time to sink in. Yeah, it needs time to sink in. That's, that's, that's definitely a thing. Um, people take information and it needs they need to sleep on it, think about it the next day, and then if they practice, then it starts sinking in better. Um, I, I have different groups, and if somebody comes to me who wants to have a barista job, then say uh, I had one recently who's going back to Brazil and then off to New, um, Australia. So I had to teach him the traditional Italian style espresso and what he would need to know in a specialty cafe. So we kept it. I kept the facts really thin, uh, really small, but just what he needed to know. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, he's not going to absorb everything. Sure. But he needs to be prepared for standing in front of a machine in two different scenarios. In order to allocate enough time for um, education and, and training, and I know every every coffee bar is different, but minimum, maybe maybe talking to this, uh, like how long do we train baristas problem before we can put them on the bar. Um, what, what, what have you seen as most successful uh, in terms of minimum X number of, of days or hours of training? And you tend to see a good improvement that where you can trust them with the basics on the bar don't know depends on the person some people pick it up really quickly some people can't mm -hmm. um it depends on if they're the fast learner that can take like uh four five six different things thrown at them or the one the slower learner that can only take about three and takes a little bit longer to put all these things into their long-term memory and speed up. But um, it is such a luxury to be able to train somebody uh, before putting them on bar. I mean, in the past, it was, you were just on bar. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I picked up once back in 2000, I was working, managing, uh, no, 99. Oh, 1999, I was managing a second wave coffee <laughs> place in London. And uh, somebody didn't turn up to work, and I was stuck. And some Spanish guy walked in, and he said, have you got a job? I went, yes. Now, get behind the bar. <laughs> and uh, I had him pulling shots. First of all, he was just stacking things and running around. By the end of the day, I had him pulling shots. And it's, um, it's because he, uh, he could do it. Making coffee, when you break it down, as much as we like to think it's very difficult, the basic technique of um, making coffee is not that difficult. You grind, falls in, distribute it, tamp, put it in, press the button, grab the cup. It's really not that difficult, especially with the equipment we're using these days. So if people over-glorify it and they need uh, special uh, training before they go on the machine, then um, it's going to cost them a lot of money to do that. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's, uh, if you're, most, there are some business models that, that works for. The cafes I talked about in Moscow, Coffee Mania, that works for them. Big, intensive uh, training before they go on bar. But most of the places that um, I've managed they can't do that. Milk is difficult. Pulling shots is pretty, pretty easy. Mm -hmm. Especially with the distribution these days, there's much less talk about the distribution. That's one thing that helped me and I think um, made me realize that I, as a trainer, and more about helping people practice, answering questions, and helping them with recall, but not just giving knowledge. When Barista Hustle put uh, online and uh, they fell behind the tapping technique for distribution, sure. 
fantastic. Saved me about half an hour every single training. So we didn't have to go through this tapping, this is what you do, and then go through the whole, why can't I touch it, or anything. Suddenly, it was like over a few months, once, once the blog post went up, over a few months, suddenly I was having a half an hour extra in my training so I didn't have to discuss uh, distribution. And not only that, it also gave me a success in my own cafe. In my own cafe, I couldn't get them to stop touching the coffee. It's like, don't do it, gave the reasons, but it didn't listen to me. So, okay. Uh, so I was training differently to what my cafe was doing, proof rock coffee. Um, but then as soon as the blog post came out from uh, Barista Hustle about the tapping technique to distribute, mm -hmm. um, then it was okay. And then proof rock changed. It was just that little thing. I <laughs> needed to push them to stop uh, touching the coffee. So as a trainer, very simple things like that, I want people to pick up before they come to me. Yeah, so the, the tapping technique is something that and I use as well, and it's so, it's, it's so much easier than the uh, finger swiping north, south, east, west, um, things I was doing when I was competing. Uh, just the hands are dirty, the coffee is... Yeah groomed at the top and not at the bottom it's ridiculous uh, but anyway not to get into that too much because it can, that's a rabbit trail in itself but uh, you mentioned milk as uh, a really difficult thing would you suggest that people do allocate a good uh, maybe even more time perfecting their milk yeah i would put people on shots first when i was in cafes uh then i would move them onto milk because you can look after the shots person from milk. Mm. It's fine. And it takes less time to make shots than milk. Milk is where the most of the time is taken. Why is that? Um, pouring the milk into the jug, steaming, pouring. It depends on the, <laughs> it depends on the barista um, because there's a lot of things to do. But if you start doing things with two hands instead of one thing with two hands, uh, it's much faster. Mm -hmm. Like when you're steaming, you can be pouring milk into the jug. When you're um, steaming, you can be actually pouring, especially if uh, yes. you can be pouring the other takeaway drink. Yes. It's one thing baristas have lost the skill of is uh, pouring while the cup is on the table. It's not difficult. No, we um, it used to be the one of the only ways that it was done. Yes, <laughs> yeah, and the picking up and how you handle the cup. If you don't handle the cup uh, by the handle and you're putting it underneath, it takes you like three or four seconds, three or two, two or three seconds longer to put it onto the the saucer. Mm -hmm. If you have it by the handle and you're pouring low, if you're one of those. YouTube baristas that uh, hold the cup up to their face <laughs> and lift their hand really high above their head and start pouring, and then you have to put it down on the counter, you're, you're just wasting time. Sure. So there are many things that people can do, but um, milk, is, milk, milk is difficult because it's, it's not just about your hand movements, it's about the flow of the milk. So you're adjusting your hand movements depending on how the milk is moving. Mm -hmm. There yeah. isn't like this one technique. It depends how the milk's moving. Yeah. I, I actually hate teaching milk. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so frustrating. It's one of those classes where people come in um, for latte art classes and they expect to go out um, being able to do some amazing patterns when usually the, many people go out worse because you're correcting techniques and bad habits and they have to get worse so they can start doing the bad ha the good habits get rid of the bad habits and then practice uh, so yeah. as they're leaving it's like you know you have to re-break the bone almost, yeah you have to re-break the bone it's terrible <laughs> it's terrible um well, definitely uh, agree. And that's a uh, milk is so tricky. Once you get it, it's like riding a bike. It's really yes. you know, a revelatory experience. <laughs> and we were lucky because we were baristas at a time when latte art was not that common or that good. So 
we were actually um, improving with the customers. With uh, We were like probably the best thing the customer had seen. <laughs> I want to ask finally here, um, what your advice would be to those who are in charge of setting up training in their cafes um, a lot of, I mean, you mentioned Coffee Mania and there's other coffee bars that spend a lot of time and energy on training. And then there's coffee bars that you were describing from the early years. Um, and there are still coffee bars that do this where it's just, there's no training hardly. It's just all drinking from a fire hose. Uh, what is it that you would advise owners to do when it comes to, you know, investing into training their staff? Uh, I would say do it. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be done during uh, staff hours. They can offer training uh, extra that is not being paid, that's just events and things happening. Uh, we have some people coming for trainings where the owner will pay for the training, but the barista pays for the certification if they want the certificate. Uh, as an owner... I would set myself, what do I want? And I would want from a barista consistency, speed, uh, low wastage, and good quality. Uh, so you can set the quality. So what is the quality? Um, using the WBC sensory score sheets makes things easier. So I won't have any, say, um, nothing goes out as a milk beverage if it's not a 3.5 visually. Nothing goes out as an espresso unless it's a sensory three mm -hmm. score sensory. Um, wastage, maybe three, three mils per jug or something, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which is no. Uh, so work out what wastage is acceptable for milk Work out how fast do you want your baristas to be. I mean, that's going to be linked to your prices and your business model. So uh, really, anybody who can't do four six-ounce cappuccinos in under four minutes should not be on, be on bar during a rush. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're not going to make enough profit to uh, make money from coffee. So work out what time you want your baristas to achieve to make the drinks and don't just look at the baristas going god that one's really fast without timing them there are some baristas that look really fast because their arms are moving and they're moving around they're not usually the fastest ones <laughs> the fastest ones are usually the ones using as few movements as possible and you don't really notice them they're just the calm little quiet ones in the back not making any noise but usually they're the fastest and they're producing yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, uh, to answer your question, you, you have to know what you're training for. Direct it towards that. Um, if there are more things you would like your baristas to learn and you can't afford it as a business because your staff costs are already high enough, then uh, do it outside of uh, the business hours. Mm -hmm. And so people are doing it on their own time. And I, I mean, when I first let, met, um, learned how to make coffee, nobody taught me. I was, um, I'm from the old school where we had to train ourselves. So I volunteered. I was delivering cups of coffee to the table uh, in New Zealand. I was fascinated by the baristas, but nobody was going to teach me how to do it. So I volunteered to clean the ovens. In the cafe so I clean the ovens and then when uh, everybody nobody else was in the cafe I just turn on the espresso machine and uh, two nights a week and uh, practice for an hour and so <laughs> I taught myself I'd be watching them and I taught myself so as an as a business owner yes offer opportunities and help but the barista has to meet you halfway mm -hmm. you can't just give and as a barista you can't expect your boss to just give you you have to give to you have to engage that's the engagement from both sides well said yeah totally agree um 
I, I, this has been really a fantastic talk. Um, there's so much that you've said that I, I think is really going to help shape the way people pursue training and become better at training people. So, um, how can people reach out to you, find out more about what you do, especially if they want to, uh, come out and visit you and do some training? Well, if they, <laughs> if they come and visit, uh, I, I am tucked away, uh, like 40 minutes bus ride in just south of Prague in the Bohemian forests, uh, in amongst all the wild pigs. But uh, there are three little sausage dogs here to protect you if you come. Um, I'm easy enough to find on uh, social media. That's fine. Excellent. And, and also, that description Chris, makes me want to go more. <laughs> thank you for uh, doing the podcast. It's uh, a lot of effort, I know, and I'm definitely one person who has benefited from uh, listening listening to you. Well, I appreciate you saying so, Gwilym. Thank you so much for your time and, and sharing today. Thank you, Chris. Well, I hope you really enjoyed that conversation with Gwilym. There's so much wisdom here everywhere from just how to prepare yourself to um, taking it on a case-by-case basis when it comes to training the people that come in through your doors, be they uh, a class that's coming in that you're teaching or uh, baristas that you've hired that need to have individual attention and um, are going to have various styles of learning. As a trainer, it can be really tempting to just go through the motions and check off the boxes for what the curriculum says you should do. And you would be technically successful, put air quotes around that, but would the barista be successful? And I guess that would make you not successful if they're not. You're, you're trying to create um, understanding of coffee, an understanding of what it is to be a barista in the mind of the people that come through those doors. And uh, of course, we always need to be learning about what it is to be a barista, what it is to be a coffee professional. So always learning yourself is going to be uh, really important as well. And, and one of the uh, final things that I thought was really fantastic was the idea that it's not so much a transference of knowledge as it is an inspiration, being an inspiration to somebody because they can acquire the knowledge especially well um, if they are inspired to acquire it. And you could tell somebody something um, and, and it can be factual about coffee if it's uninspiring, they're less likely to apply it, believe it, retain it. If they're inspired, it's really, really easy for them to latch onto it, own it, and make it a part of their career and what they do behind the bar. So thank you, Gwilym, for uh, inspiring us with this conversation and helping us become trainers that inspire others as well. So if you want to reach out to Gwilym, you can do so easily by going to his website, gwilymdavies.cz. You can also go to Instagram or Twitter. His handle there is at Gwilym Barista. And if you want the show notes for this episode, you can go to keystotheshop.com. And on the website, you'll find a place to put your email address. When you do that, you'll be signed up to receive the show notes and news about Keys to the Shop directly to your inbox. And the show notes are really handy because they're a breakdown of the main points and takeaways from each episode, as well as the resources mentioned in each episode that includes links, references, things like that. So if you're driving in the car and you listen to it and you, you really want to write something down, the chances are pretty high that it's included in the show notes. And so you don't have to worry about it. You'll find it in your inbox. Now, if you want to reach out to me, you can do so by emailing Chris at keys to the shop.com. I would love to hear your comments, questions, and feedback. Uh, maybe some suggestions for topics on the show would be amazing. I always want to make this show more relevant to you and valuable uh, so that it can help build your business and your career in coffee. I hope you take these nuggets of wisdom from Willem today and apply them in your training scenarios. And uh, you'll definitely see some great results from that. Thank you for joining me once more. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop. Keys to the shop.